on the council when the opera house opened and the intent was always that the opera house would become independent and i have real problems with the monies that we have been putting into the opera house over the last number of years so um can you talk to me about those problems well, I think that $170,000, $165,000 is too much considering how we have very, very limited abilities to raise the levy. And this is, this is levied money. And so my question to you is, do you have a business plan? If not, when is it going to uh, surface and when will we see it? Um. I, w I wouldn't say that we have a business plan in the sense that you would if you were operating completely as a private business. Um, the decision to fund those two positions over at the Opera House was something that was made in, I think it was 2012 maybe, when that decision was made. Um, as far as the specific question about a business plan, uh, I've had conversations with the Opera House Friends Association as well as uh, members of this group and the mayor and, and, and so forth about what kinds of opportunities we'll have going forth to open up other revenue streams, um, both through the relocation of some of the departments in City Hall as well as other methods. But to get to the uh, subtext, um, I would strongly disagree with you that that the city isn't getting a return that justifies the expense of that hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars because I think it represents 17 percent of the revenues that we bring in and the other what I, I can't do the math on it off the top of my head because uh, I actually ran over from an opera house show but actually I, I did not say don't put words in my mouth okay I didn't say that I have, I do have problems with the fact that we are subsidizing you and I would like to see a plan where you become, where the Opera House becomes much more independent of the city's revenue. Again, because we have very little options in how we can raise our levy. And this is an area where I think that a good business plan would, if implemented, could actually re, you could re, we could reduce your dependency on the city, and so that is my request: is to have a business plan presented to us, in, so that we can see that in the future your dependency on the city is being reduced. I'm not saying that you're not a positive, you know, to the city. You are a positive, but the the issue is we have we are very constrained and this is an opportunity you know where I see that if a good business plan is put in place we can reduce the dependency on the tax levy yeah so, and I just and I I couldn't agree with you more that it would be nice to be completely independent of the city um, I would say that the amount of the subsidy is 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 far less than uh, comparable communities. The one that I think about is somebody like Woodstock. I know that you're not uh, in Illinois. I know you're not specifically uh, saying that you think that the city shouldn't put any money into the Opera House. You just like to see a business plan that gets to a very substantial reduction. Is yes, I think that that's. I think that that to me is is fiscally responsible because we are so constrained yeah. in what we can okay. you know in what we can do with our tax levy i mean okay. um we've so. taken care of that that's okay. that's more than enough we're um talking about the budget and i think if you have issues with it i think you need to go to the opera house board meeting and and start there with it this is about the budget for this year and how this is affecting our operating and now i have a question by Walter I, johnson uh, thank you, President. Um, I, it's kind of on the same line, so I'll just, I don't even know if I want to. Bill, 
being on the opera board, I learned more uh, about it this year that what I didn't know is about the salaries as far as being part Can you of talk into the mic Oh, I'm more. sorry. Thank I you. I thought I was. Um, about the, the salaries of the employees that are, are part of your budget, like if we have EMS and police, that's part of a service we get and we pay their salaries. So I just want people to be clear that the it's not just the overhead of the opera house, it's for employees that are being paid that are coming for the budget too. Yeah, and actually none of that money goes towards operations in any sense other than the staffing. But, and I don't mean to belabor a point that as you pointed out, maybe is better addressed at the opera house. Yep board, but I think it's completely legitimate, you know, to bring that up. Uh, obviously, we want to see a reduction there. I, you know, it, it gets under my skin only because of the, the amount of that dollar amount relative to the overall operating budget of the city, and I don't know what, what is the overall operating budget of the city? What's the total? Roughly rounding. Million? Yeah, if you yeah, count that service, it's up to around 14. It's about, about 14 million, million and we're talking about, you know, 170,000. And then I see what that does to the community, and I've seen what it's done over the course of the last decade and what I can see it doing in the coming decade. And I don't know if that will make it a budget neutral item or not going forward, but I can say we can do more for the community for the dollars that we are receiving. And, I mean, you know, I don't know if we can make it budgetarily neutral, but I know that we can, that I, I see a lot of positives coming beyond what we've already done. Um, for the amount that is being spent. So, I mean, I think it's a really good value. Alder Borsma. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. <coughs> Mr. President. Um, what I am concerned about a bit is that um, our Opera House is now appealing to a lot of, um, a lot of people both in the city and also outside the city. I think there's been a growing trend that there are fewer uh, local things at the Hopper House because you are so crowded with other uh, uh, venue, other people coming in to, to the, and I've had this, I've had this concern for years and years and years that you, uh, that you need to balance, I think, to get the support of the community, which I think you already have, but that you uh, probably look to um, a, a little bit more favoring of some local local shows than you do. Now, I, I know that I well, know that I, that's I, I not should probably address that just right away. Um, we actually have more community programming now than we ever have at any point in the past, including when the op in, in the first 50 years of the Opera House's operation, we have more events that are from Stoughton that are from community groups in Stoughton than we ever have okay. before. Bill, I know I know that I know that That's there's been some but decline because you know I'm, there, there I'm involved with the number been. I don't want to argue with this on this, but well, I know that there's some local some, some local uh, venues that try to get into the opera house that have a difficult time because um, you are so booked and I think I you need to keep I think you need to keep that up. I th I mean I think you need to look at it and I would say that if you're going to have a business plan, that that should be also some reaching out to people who uh, who are local who can who can use it. And I I do see some decline in the ability for there us to get into that. There just simply isn't. If you, I can sit you down and I can count off the events for you if that will help alleviate those concerns. Well, I think that that's I think that that would be a fine thing to also include in a plan. Yeah, so. and I, I can do a count on that and present it to you at the at the budget. Um, approval meeting okay so that you can see that that actually is not the case okay. or even in fact true okay well and, uh, I just experienced it that's true so but but if you can document I think that it's um, I, I and you're crowded and I understand that but uh, I think that there should be uh, and, and and maybe maybe you're reaching out to to venues that you know, in the week weekdays, maybe and maybe not so much on weekends. Maybe that's what I'm I'm saying, but who knows? Okay, uh, Mayor, you had a sure. Um, <coughs> thanks, uh, Mr. President. So, as Bill mentioned, we have talked um, not only one on one, but with the committee about putting together a business plan, and I think we'll be able to put something together once we have a clear understanding of what we're going to do with the bank and how much space that's going to create for for other opportunities and and we're going to want to get council feedback on that 
So I think we'll work that into probably, you know, more for next year's budget than the one that we're working on right now. And there are a number of of local things, and you know, the the balance is is, you know, do we want to let a local group use the opera house for free, instead of having an event where we're actually generating revenue and how do we find that balance to your point especially on the weekends because that's like a lot of businesses and in entertainment in particular that's where the highest demand is well and when i came on board in 2007 uh, groups like the festival choir the chamber singers the city band they'd all been priced out of the opera house by the in by the person who was the director for a year in the middle there um, and they were not coming and playing at the opera house anymore. That was all done. The Greek male chorus, that was all done. That wasn't happening anymore. Now those groups are basically using, using the, the facility for very, very small amount of, of whatever revenues they might bring in. We're not charging them basically anything up front. And all those groups have come back and they're all performing at the opera house. We've got the city band, the festival choir, the chamber singers. Greek male chorus is rehearsing up there every other Tuesday. We've got a music appreciation event that's going on. They used to be at the Senior Center when they outgrew the space down there. We have those there every Monday, even though, uh, <laughs> despite the, our staffing constraints, uh, there's just an enormous amount of community uh, events going on, and I, I, I'm just mystified by that perception, and it tells me that, that, you know, that you're not looking. So I, I think the bottom line is, is we're not going to be able to solve all the concerns that are raised tonight, but we are working toward looking at ways we can find balances and then generate additional revenues because the Opera House on ticket sales alone, I don't think it could ever be self-sufficient. It's not really even set up as an enterprise fund. So if you look at some of the other departments that we provide services, we subsidize them too. I mean, you could say the same thing about Park and Rec. They're providing services for our communities that people of all ages enjoy, and we have to provide staffing for that as well. So, you know, we're trying to do a lot of things in the community, and they all cost money, and we're certainly, you know, uh, hear what you're saying, and, and we're working toward not only with the Opera House, but any opportunity we find to um, increase revenue or, you know, decrease its expenses, I think that's what the process is all about. So we certainly hear you loud and clear, um, but like everything else that we're trying to provide the service, you know, there's benefits for the community um, and for the businesses in, in the community, and I think the Opera House plays a huge role in economic development and it's really hard to put a price tag on that, but if you compare it to the study we recently received for the Whitewater Park, where it says every person that would use that park is gonna spend $68 while you're here, and somewhere in town, you would hope that the Opera House would generate the same type of economic development. The challenge right now is we're not capturing any of that additional $68 they're spending in town. And I think that's what the business plan that Denise is talking about is all about. Well, and we have to be careful not to um, step on the toes of the businesses that the Opera House has helped to, um, to start up and stay in business. So it's kind of a fine line that we have to figure out and work with the community on, the business community, that is. All right, I have O'Connor, Jensen, Bartlett, and then Borsma. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I agree with what the mayor said in terms of the benefit that we get <clears throat> from uh, the Opera House for a pretty minimal investment. Um, I don't see that as a problem whatsoever. Um, I think you run pretty lean on your employee staff, and I suspect that holds you back in able to hold shows during the middle of the week and whatnot. But my primary question was, um, with the McFarland State Bank, is are you planning anything to do with that this year, or is that all going to be in the future? It really depends on the, the speed at which the rest of that project goes forward. I think there's things that we can do immediately that, um, that are kind of uh, the kinds of things that people would think about. 
uh, just simply having additional space to do things like have a, a space that's available for merchandise sales, uh, potentially concessions initially, just working on the issue of, say, maybe having water for sale or things like that and avoiding the issue of alcohol altogether. But, I mean, th there's those sorts of, of straightforward things that I think we could do right away. Um, and then there's other more ambitious uh, ideas that uh, I think we could start to work on as soon as we get a better picture of where we are at. So you're not budgeting anything for this year for that? No. Not in 19. All right. Great. You done? Uh, <coughs> then let's hear from Matt. Yeah, I just had two questions if I can. First, your health insurance savings. You had, this year you had two employees, uh, two signal and then one family plan, and next year you just have two on a single plan. Are you op do you have one position open or just one that moved we off the plan? We have one that, okay. uh, you know, bless their heart, they don't need the insurance coverage to have it from their uh, okay. Just spouse. checking. I wasn't aware if you had an opening or not, so that's good. Okay. And I guess one other question was the net of revenue and appropriations, you have about 33000 there. What is that going to, and do we need to budget to have about thir that much, or could we cut that in half and leave about 15000 back in the general fund? It's not a ton of money overall, but it would definitely help other areas. Did you use that full, what are you using that 14000 for this year for? And well, basically what it, com or what it comes down to is that um, the proposed 2018 budget numbers, and it's the same deal with 2019, is that I booked all of the 18, 19, it's 2018, so yeah, the 18, or wait, the nine, yeah, the 18, 19 performance season, and then done projections on what I expect to sell in terms of tickets for each of those shows, and then what I expect the cost to be in terms of what we're paying the performer, what we're covering as far as hospitality expenses or equipment expenses, and then come up with a with a, a net number for what we're making off of those shows, then also gone in and done a projection on on our memberships and donations and all that kind of stuff to, to get a bottom line on our season. Then I take those season numbers and use them as the calendar year numbers for the calendar year that's coming up because I don't know what's gonna happen in the f second half of 19. So um, in the past, uh, I've budgeted very tightly. Um, and that 14, I think, is, is pretty tight. Um, and it's an interesting dynamic between the year, the calendar year and the season year. But um, that number is, is larger just from, just because there's such a, a large number when you look at the amount of, of dollars going out the door that is, needs to be compensated for. That's the guarantees largely. I mean, it's $418,000 that we're spending. We know that. As far as ticket sales go, <coughs> it, you know, we, we need to, I, I kind of tried to budget in for mistakes <coughs> because that's not something that's happened in the past. Okay, thanks. Another thing with that, if I might just jump in too, is the, the Opera House is actually running a negative fund balance at this point, so I'd much rather if they do have excess revenues to continue to kind of build up that, that amount. Uh, just question what number we should target for. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, so, okay. Alder Borsma? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I want to just follow up on what uh, Denise was saying, and that is, I think, um, I think it would be, I think it's, it would, nothing happens until, until it's planned for. Uh, and especially with all the changes that potentially are going to happen where you're taking over more of the, more of the facility and that kind of thing, I think that this should be, if possible, a year that you know, some real planning goes into the, the whole the whole thing. I think, including including you know how the uh, uh, the the shows and the and the how much documents, how much you know how much local stuff is happening, and um, w how to wean yourself. I, I don't know if that's a correct way, but. Of the city um, coffers that we we need to, this may be a good year to do that start because I think it, um, I, you know I think if you look at the pattern and, and 
I was also on the Opera House a number of years ago, and that was, that, and that was before you arrived, I think. But it was, um, it was really, uh, really a thought that it would be a self-sufficient, um, um, you know, entity in Stoughton, and that was kind of the intent when this whole thing got started, and um, and the city was going to compensate for a while, but not forever. And I remember that specifically when I was on uh, the uh, Opera House board when we first started it. So. Okay, uh, Alder Reeves. Uh, I found, I figured it out, so never mind, right. I think. Any other questions regarding the 2019 budget numbers? If not, thank you, Bill. Enjoy your show. Yeah, when is the, what's the date for the final budget meeting? We're not going to have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and I'll just see you guys later. Right. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Merci. Merci. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let them know by email. Okay, so. All right. IT is next. next. We have. We're going to start back up at the top now. Yep. We'll, we'll start back with IT. Information um, technology. Yes. So <coughs> we'll kind of go the same format we did last week for those folks that weren't here last week. The the items go in alphabetical order. So if I'm referring to something, it might help you kind of find it. Mm. it goes 15, 16, 17 actual activity, 18 budget, and then 19 budget, and then the variance between the two. I'll just touch on some high points and then we'll just field questions as we move along here. So, um, so if we start just kind of working our way down, um, overall, I guess we'll start with an overall budget increase of $18,000 or 6%. IT, I'm going to tell you right now, is kind of a moving target at this point because it is kind of new and we're, we're working to shift more costs out of individual departments over to IT that should be more IT related. So I think I, the IT budget overall is going to be a work in progress for the next couple of years until we really nail that down. With that said, we'll kind of just start going through these line by line here um, and I'll touch on the high points. Um, so the first number that jumps out here is the equipment maintenance uh, expense line and you can see that's dropping by about $23,400 compared to eighteen. Um, again, we just budgeted this to fall more in line with the actual historical amounts that have been going in there. And you can see we're looking at 6,500, 7,700, 9,600, 18. We jumped back up to 33,000 for some reason. It's unreasonable, so we knocked it back down to 10,000 to get that back in line in terms of what it should be. Uh, the next line there, health insurance, you can see we see a jump of about $8,100. This will be a reoccurring theme through a bunch of the departments. They either go up by a ton or down. Or, or down. Um, both uh, both employees in the IT department actually have the family plans. So with the new tier structure, they're getting a big hit in 19. So that's a big chunk of the increase there. Uh, the next line item that jumps out here is the outside services slash contracts dash website. Um, you can see we knocked that down by about $11,000. Um, again, we just budgeted that to fall more in line with what the actual historical amounts are looking looking like. And unfortunately, 18 is the only year that we have this information for and I look today year to date it's sitting right around nine thousand dollars so that's the reason we dropped that one down um, and then the the second outside services contracts line you can see we're bumping that up by about thirty one thousand nine hundred and fifty again this is just reshuffling some maintenance costs maintenance contract costs over to IT pulling them out of other departments um, and I believe that also includes some disaster recovery that John is planning for next year um, Salary is pretty straightforward. You can see the 3% jump there. Um, and that's really all that jumped out in terms of analytics when I was looking at these line items. Um, any specific questions for me or John? What does the equipment maintenance budget cover? What, what equipment is that? It's any of the network equipment, uh, maintenance agreements on, for instance, all the Cisco devices, switches, firewalls, uh, the telephone system maintenance, con annual maintenance contracts. So strictly network stuff, not individual computers? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, Johnson. Hi, thank you. Um, John, you know what we were talking about last night in the public safety? Mm -hmm. Would that go under your 
budget? Would it go under public safety or? <coughs> a great question. It'd be a great question and. For someone to answer? <laughs> for someone to, to answer. Okay, because I want that to happen. So can we just put $1,000 somewhere? Yeah, basically what this Could is. Can you enlighten us on to what that subject would be? <laughs> what? It's a secret. secret. Oh, okay. Do you all remember the uh, pre presidential <coughs> alert announcement that came out a few weeks ago and it went all over your cell phones? Uh -huh. um, I remember. Excuse me. Similar to that. And basically what it was is... Uh, uh, Coming from me? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Alder Tass Johnson, basically, had come up with the idea that, you know, in light of all of the, the gas explosions, you know, we've got Sun Prairie, we've got Boston, we've got... Um, you know, just a plethora of things that are going on. Would Stoughton benefit by something like that? And we looked at uh, some possibilities, even breaking it down by district. You know how you get all those text messages from, you know, 47, 47, 47, you know, click, you know, send this text or, you know, send enroll to that number. It's the same type of deal and, and it would be set up by, you would text district one to this particular phone, uh, series of numbers district two to this one and as you did that it would put it would put everybody in their specific district so if you had an emergency situation within that district those people would get in a uh, text message or if you selected all four districts it would go to everybody who signed up so uh, the, I found out about a gas leak in my neighborhood by someone in Madison that was going to channel 3000 and I was really disturbed because blocks were I think evacuated or asked to leave and I know um, one of my friends in Sun Prairie gets texts about things that are happening if they have to evacuate or something like that and I just would hate with John looking into the cost that there might be a major catastrophe and we're not notifying our people to get out of their homes or something like that so. yeah. yeah yeah I was at the meeting too last night and it sounds like a good idea to me but um, I mean we're a long way from implementation we have to decide just what we're going to broadcast and <coughs> and how we're going to go about it and the numbers I were I was looking at weren't significant at all you know a thousand dollars or something and mm -hmm. I think that could easily come out of um, contingency funded if we should decide to fund it mid-year I would think if it, that that's the number yeah it sounds like public safety has to to discuss this more with John I would think and there's there'd be a lot of mechanics that have to be worked out as far as uh, one of the scenarios that we threw out last night was if you've got a an emergency situation you know Who's going to be doing this? Would it be dispatch? Well, if you have an emergency situation, dispatch is extremely busy. How are they going to be doing that when their first and foremost uh, role is to, you know, keep officer safety? Well, you know, so it's a whole mechanic. Something. Yeah, it, it sounds like a process has to be worked out. Correct. So. All right. Any other questions regarding the budget items? None. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Yeah, see. All right. John. Next up, we'll go through Rodney's information here. He's got a few. Um, some of them are very straightforward, so we can probably just blow through them pretty quickly. Um, here's the assessor budget for next year. You can see no changes. They're actually on a locked contract. I think it started in 2016. Mm -hmm. I think it's locked <coughs> in the next five years. So no changes there. Pretty pretty easy. Any questions on the assessor? <laughs> Um, next one here is inspection. Um, you can see really the only shifts here relate to employee benefits, health insurance, um, and salaries. Those are the big shifts here, and you can see they all went down. Um, the reason for this is that I moved Rodney's salary that had been allocated in past years in the budget to this to this actual um, department. I moved it to where time is actually being coded so I actually moved it to planning and out of inspection so that's why you see a decrease here so, we're so um, other than that not many not not any major changes here in inspection either any questions on this one mm-hmm 
Okay. Um, and then we have city buildings is up next. Um, again, not too many big shifts here. You can see the health insurance jumped up a little bit. Um, again, that's because of the majority of employees allocated to city buildings have either the family or the self plus spouse insurance. Yes. Yeah, so um, we've taken on McFarland Bank. Is this where the utilities would go for the McFarland Bank? We would have a separate fund probably created or separate account created for the McFarland State Bank. And ha this is has not utilities for all the buildings. This is for some of them. Okay. And so um, where is the McFarland Bank at then? So that one is probably, we don't know of all the costs and everything for that. So we're probably going to set up a separate account. Either it's in the city buildings or we're going to track it through the building maintenance fund since there's some monies available there. And that's how we'll deal with 19. And then 2020 would be budgeted differently. We can take utilities out of uh, building maintenance? There's no real specifications in what we're doing with it. So. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Why the significant reduction in um, repairs and maintenance? I, I missed it. It's just related to the trends that we've been experiencing in, in the facility. So I've been positive. Um, 17, I think there was a lot of water damage. I wasn't here, but apparently a lot of water damage. Um, I looked year to date, we're at $4,500 right now. Okay. Any questions on city buildings? <clears throat> okay. Moving on to planning. Um, so again, you can see there's shifts in employee benefits, health insurance, and then the salaries. Those are the big jumps here. But again, that's due to shifting the costs out of inspection into planning where the time has historically been uh, being coded. Um, again, the we're seeing the family and the self plus spouse insurance plans with Rodney's staff. Um, so that's a big hit this year too with the, the tier adjustment. Um, let's see, other than that, you can see operating expenses are going up about $5,200. Um, again, we just did that to fall more in line with what the actual uh, trends have been. Um, I looked year to date this today and we're at about eight, $18,900. So 22250 is a good number for 19. So any questions on planning? Okay. Now the fun one. This one's kind of hard to follow, um, but this is the stormwater budget. Um, so the stormwater funds itself through its own rates. Um, <coughs> You can see there's a significant jump in terms of percentage, and that's the table on the far right-hand side. Um, if you see a 7% increase in rates, you kind of think, oh my gosh, that's a ton. But that $4.28 is the actual annual impact per ERU. Um, and the reason this is happening, obviously we see some shifts in operating costs um, that hopefully in the end, we'll, we'll create some efficiencies and reduce capital costs. I think Rodney has about a $21,000 leaf study in his budget this year. Um, and the plan for that is that down the road, it'll reduce mm -hmm. some capital infrastructure costs that we would have to have to incur. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the hits in 2019. Um, and then we did, I did add a new line this year. Um, it's, it's called rate of return on net plant balance. So here's, the, there's kind of a weird thing about stormwater budgets. Um, it's a new utility, so basically all of its infrastructure has been funded through debt up until 2019. So the plan for 2019 is to fund all infrastructure costs through the, the built-up fund balance. Um, so you can see in the, in the rate structure and how we design these, we are recovering through rates the debt service cost. But now the utility is kind of at a point where it can self-sustain itself for a while and pay for its own infrastructure costs, but we're not earning any money on the actual assets that are in the ground already. So I just built in a very, very small rate of return on those existing assets to basically start building up almost, we'll call it a replacement fund for future years. So this will hopefully begin to eliminate the need for the stormwater to rely on debt unless it's a big project. This is very similar to how the water and electric utilities work where they earn about a 5% rate of return on their plant balances. Um, I think 
the number I used in here, I started with a 1% rate of return. So it's very small. And the plan would be to kind of just inch this up year after year. So maybe we go to 1.5% next year, 2% next year. Um, and, and that's the plan for it. Because the weird thing with this proposed budget and how we're recovering rates right now is you can see there's, no, there's nothing in there for depreciation. And this is kind of built is building a way to recover that depreciation cost to replace the assets down the road. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a whole new line. So that's why we're starting to see this big jump. It won't be this big from here on out. We're kind of taking the big hit in 19 and hopefully we can just start inching up that rate of return to more of a reasonable number like three or four percent and kind of get the, the storm water to be more self-sustaining by its rates. So any questions on storm water? I got um, so I've been up in the Dells this week for um, for a conference, and one municipality, one of the things that they've done, and I'm not recommending we do it here, but I'm just sharing this, is what they're doing is instead of special assessments, they're actually charging their road projects to the stormwater fund and using the the same formula to fund their road improvements instead of doing special assessments on everything. So I thought that was kind of an interesting idea. I don't know if it's a good idea for Stoughton, but it kind of gives you a flavor of where other municipalities are right now and how we're trying to work together to think outside the box. So I just wanted to share that little tidbit with everybody as long as we're here. Any more questions on the stormwater? Okay. You're off the hook, Rodney. Mm -hmm. You're off the hook. <laughs> so Rodney can go. <laughs> he said he's going to leave as soon as his computer dies. So. Yeah. You have inspections to do yet tonight? Early tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll start off with Brett's information here. We'll get one of the big ones out of the way here, highway and street maintenance. Um, start with the bottom line. You can see we're jumping. I'll scroll down a little bit here so you can see it. Uh, you can see we're jumping about $25,000, but the scheme of Brett's overall budget, that's only 2%. Okay, so not a big jump at all in terms of percentage. Um, and then I'll just start working my way down. So the first number that kind of pops out there is contracted services slash urban forestry. You can see it's dropping by about $9,500. Mm -hmm. um, can I touch on that real, real sure. quick? Yeah. The reason why that looks like a, a decrease is that we actually carried over money from 17 into 18. So we actually aren't decreasing the actual budget that we had in there from years past. It's been 15,000 or 50,000, excuse me, um, in, in 2017 and 18. We carried over 9,500, so that's why it looks like it's decreasing in 19, but it's really staying stagnant. Okay, um, so the next one that, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Um, does any of this cover the Dutch Elm stuff? Mm -hmm. No, that's all capital. I see two times. That, uh, animal dash bore, is that? Germ. Ash bore. Uh, yeah. yeah. It looks yep. German, Where's my uh, tree commission, as I understand it, what's happening with the tree commission when you're planting trees, that the developers are planting the trees and that we are getting some kind of break because um, they are guaranteeing the trees that we plant. Could you just tell people about that? So yeah, we, you know, anytime we do a development, they do are required to plant trees uh, per our, our formula. Uh, we have a set price um, in place that we set annually. Um, and then through our contracts that we've negotiated, there's a one year warranty in all trees that are planted. And that includes trees that we plant on, on the park rows same, and, same and also contract. the developers are using that service too? But that same contract so we can control what's planted in our urban forest. The developer's not planting we Correct. No, we're we're planting that we're planting the trees that the developer pays for through our contract. Okay, but there's a guarantee when we buy the trees. Is yes. that right? Yes. And that they'll replace the trees if they go bad. The nursery will, will replace replace the trees uh, within one year. If they and that's not them. how it used to be. Correct. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, just moving down the line here, you can see the, the next big change here is health insurance. We have a de decrease of about $18,000. Um, again, that's because 75% of the street's employees either have single or self plus spouse, spouse insurance. Um, so they're getting a little bit of a decrease there. Um, moving down a little bit, you can see a change for $6,000 here, this dam inspection. Um, this is actually a, a one time one time expense i think every 10 years it's, it's our 10 year inspection so we won't be seeing that for a while um moving down the line again you can see the tree plantings for the developer that changed by about thirteen thousand uh, dollars but again this is offset by revenue okay. I, have a, I have a question um the dam inspection why wouldn't that be um like building like in the maintenance um from from the maintenance fund I imagine it could be. I think we just put it here because Brett, Brett's kind of in charge of it. So we, got, we operate the dam. So it, Pardon? We operate the dam from a public works perspective, so I just put in our budget. But it could be whatever you want to put in. Well, I, I'm just saying that we have money in, you know, our maintenance um, fund balance, and it's supposed to be for, you know, like all the buildings, but I would assume, you know, Maybe street. this might, we could look into seeing if this would be part, yeah, that's, this that's, could be used. That's up to you guys where you want to put those well, And I'll, I'll look at the policy too, and if it makes sense to shift it, we'll shift it. Street. Okay. Um, okay, so we touched on the tree plantings. Wages, you can see we're seeing about a jump of about 20650 but again, that's only 4%. Um, and then the wages part time, it's a, a jump of $6,164. Um, again, the, the main reason for that is it's due to one additional staff who is actually already on staff this year. Um, so the shift is, is larger compared to 2018, but that staff is already on hand, and I don't think it was budgeted for in 2018. Um, any questions for highway and street maintenance? Holly oh, Reeves. I'm just curious um, what equipment we might lease for the streets. Sure. Uh, anytime we have a, a project that, like case in point, we, we did our, our compost facility, we actually uh, built a road, and so we rented a, a track hoe. Oh, okay. um, so that's you know, it's $2,000. So we do have projects that come up through the year that instead of buying a, a $500,000 piece of equipment, we'll rent it for a week or, or two weeks for you know $1,000. So this represents a lot of different pieces yes. of equipment, probably yes. not a contract yep. or yep. anything. Yep, and then yeah. we get the same item in, in parks too. We also try to borrow from other municipalities if we can, and you know, we work out an agreement with them as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I'm a big believer in regionalization, you know, sharing resources, um, you know, us being a part of that too, letting other people use our equipment, but there has to be a contract in place. There could be some monetary exchange in that too. Partly. Are there any costs in here associated with the new building, or was that all capitalized? Everything for moving everything and anything we needed. There, there's some um, increase in uh, utility costs for one year because we're gonna be carrying two two buildings for about two months. Uh, so we did increase our our utility costs for just you know, I think it's twenty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. That's just because we're gonna be having two buildings that are operating kind of simultaneously. Unfortunately, in the winter when our costs are the highest, but that's we had to account for that. Where's that budget for the old building utility costs? Are we is that budgeted somewhere that we're still be paying utilities on the old building once you're out? Is that in someone else's budget once for the rest of the year next once year? Once we're out, essentially it goes to the RDA, and I I believe it's going to be mothballed. I, I can't. It's going to shut it off, and well, you know. they're tearing it down next year, so that's the point. Okay, is that? We still have to work out an agreement with the transfer to the RDA, and we have a request, but we haven't brought it to council yet because. Do we have a move date? Uh, it's all contingent upon when the end of construction, essentially when we get occupancy. Uh, so we're, we're making plans for the, the end of the year, early early next year. Uh, so you know, the sooner the better, but obviously they, they have to the 28th of December to complete the building. Oh, the Jurassic. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> while the electric and water may be t turned off, you still have to pay um, the stormwater fees because of all the impermeable surface. 
So we don't know when there's going to be a transfer. We don't know when it's going to come down. And guess what? You have to pay for the stormwater fees because, of course, we're paying for it, <laughs> you know, on the mill fab site and those other sites there. So that is something that needs to be there, uh, worked in. There's money, money there. Our, our operating costs for the new facility should be much lower than our current facility because of the efficiencies that we've built into it. So I think we have enough to, to get us through until demolition, whenever that may take place. Any questions left? All right, let's move on. Thank you. Okay, Brett's got a couple more here. Should go pretty quickly. Um, snow removal, you can see we Let dropped the door a little bit. Um, just moving it kind of more in line with historical, but again, with snow removal, you just never know. Um, so we didn't drop it very much, just $2,000. Um, it's not something you can really drop to fall really in line with historical information just due to the nature of you know, Wisconsin winters. Any questions on snow removal? No. All right, signs and markings. You can see no change here. Um, costs have stayed pretty consistent over the last few years, so 18000 looks like a pretty good number for 2019. Any questions on signs and markings? Um, street lighting, again, you can see we dropped it a little bit compared to last year, um, kind of falling in more in line with historical information. Um, I looked at where we're at year to date right now, we're at $88,000, which if you prorate that out, um, $128,000 looks pretty good for 2019 as well. So any questions on street lighting costs? All right, sanitation, no change. I believe we're under a contract and the rates have not changed. Um, is that, this is the last year? Correct. Through 2019, um, part of our five-year contract is that the rates remain the same for 19. Uh, they may go up in, in 2020 and in subsequent years, but they can only go up uh, based on the consumer uh, price index for all urban uh, communities for the Midwest region. So typically that's been about 2%, 3%, somewhere in there. So we're not looking at a, a huge jump in costs. Any questions on sanitation? All right. Um, cemetery costs, you can see we've run pretty consistent over the last few years. Um, so no change in 18 as well compared, or 19 compared to 18, yes. Alder Borsman. I just have one question and that is, um, how many how many cemeteries do we have? One or do we, we have? We operate two, uh, two? River, Riverside and Wheeler Prairie. And so the other cemeteries, St. Anne's and the Lutheran one, is that's They're cared private. for by them, themselves. We don't have anything to do with that. No. Okay. okay. Any other questions on cemetery? Okay. <laughs> Here we are to parks. Um, Again, we'll just kind of start going through these line by line in terms of the big numbers that jump out here. Um, health insurance, you can see, went up a little bit, $2,300, but in terms of percentage, it's at around 34%. Um, again, that's just due to the, the nature of health, the health insurance tiers this year. Um, operating expenses were increasing by about $8,000. Again, that's just to put it more in line with the historical information that we've been seeing. Um, I looked... It, it, sorry, and, and also the more structures we take on, the more uh, maintenance they take. So there is uh, accounting for extra facilities that we're we're taking on. Yep. And year to date, I looked, we're we're already at around twenty-seven thousand dollars, which is where the eighteen budget was. Um, so again, we jumped this up to to account for the historical information. Um, the next line here, you can see seasonal temporary went up about $12,600. Um, I have some notes at the bottom there, but you can see we shifted some hours um, for one employee whose, whose rate was higher than the previous individuals. Um, and then also due to a forestry intern that's already on staff. So again, a lot of this, a lot of this information, a lot of this has already happened in 2018. We're just carrying it forward for the 19 budget. And we also increased hours from 1039 to uh, 1,199. Uh, that's the essentially the limit that we can increase without impacting benefits. Other I, I don't know if this is the correct way place to ask the question, but 
Um, I was recently checking on, on how much it costs for a new developer to uh, to pay for their parks fee when they when they do a um, when when they do a development or when there's a new house built and that kind of thing, and um, I I couldn't believe how much it costs to to the people who are either building or developing, and I know that's passed on to the consumer. I've had a concern about whether or not we have a disincentive for building in the city based on that's fairly substantial amount that people have to pay for park fees and whether or not that's evenly distributed across the community because um, it's it's all that sort of upfront cost and I'm not sure that it's being it's shared within the whole community but maybe I don't know who can answer that question but it it seems like it's a bit of a disincentive I think for this this budget is for park maintenance okay so, so that's some that's some totally different so. standpoint. as part of if you'd like I can respond to that um, that's an impact fee that we established a number of years ago uh, we took into account the capital infrastructure and improvements being made to parks and so part of the park impact fee is actually related to those distribution of those expenses for capital expenditures for parks the sites that um, are more difficult to absorb or think about are the ones that are changing purpose so if you've got a platted lot that was slated for a single family lot and you're changing it and you want to have multi-family units on it then that that is then imposed the new park impact fee for all the units that would be placed there each dwelling unit is charged per dwelling unit um, similarly if a pro property is platted as a single family lot for example in theory that lot would have contributed to parkland at the time that was created if it's now creating an additional impact on it there's a fee in lieu of parkland dedication so if you've now increased the density on that parcel by 10 units for example we then um, utilize a fee in lieu of to be equivalent to that additional nine units that are being created for that parcel much like a new development when they come in they're required to develop um, so many acres of parkland or dedicate so many acres of parkland it's the same formula for re redevelopment um, case in point um, and, and some will argue whether it's a, a multi-family or senior but we don't discriminate by age or um, use it's a it's a dwelling unit all dwelling units are impacted by that um, whether they're senior housing or or other housing um, but it is something that can be looked at but it is an impact fee that we've established and it's been a long-standing practice well you know that we're um, revising the parks and open space plan this the council will see it in December and so we've hired a consultant and so the consultant helps us to determine are we in line with other communities and so I think that it has been shown that we're pretty much you know in line I mean there was a long time when we only had you know either you gave land or you did in lieu of mm -hmm. and there was no no fee for any of the development of of the park you know so now because that is something that is happening in all the other communities there is a fee to develop the park so that you don't just have empty land there when you're building homes so I don't think what we're doing is really any different than any other community in Dane County or in the counties surrounding us so it's, it's, just, it's just that um, if you if you've lived in your home forever and you don't change anything then you don't you don't you don't get zapped with it and whether or not I think we just have to be, be careful to be fair for each every resident rather than um, than zapping every new new development well you'll see it in the parks and open space okay. plan that in fact um, we have there there's going to be a capital improvement budget for five years and and he's identified 1.6 million dollars in improvements to our parks and that then would be probably most of it would be borrowed money so that then would be spread out uh -huh. to everybody in the community okay thank you 
Okay, um, I think the last line item to touch on is utilities. You can see we increased that by about $5,000. And again, that's with the Nordic Ridge splash pad online. Um, so we bumped that up to $21,000. Um, I looked year to date today, we're at $19,000. So 21,000 is a pretty good estimate for 19. So any questions for Brett on parks? I think it's such a shitty skating rink. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Brett. It's Next up, we have Senior Center. Hi. Hello. Hi, Cindy. Hi. Okay, so just a couple of big big items jump out on Cindy's information here. Um, you can see health insurance jumped up 12534 Again, it's just the nature of the beast with this new tier insurance. The majority of the senior center employees have family insurance plans. So they took a big hit this year. Um, moving down the line, the next item, you can see salaries up 2,052. That's that's that 3% mark there. Um, wages went up $3,300. That's a 2%. And then the wages for the senior case management went up $4,600. So if you look at the increase overall, 5%, half of that relates to the health insurance hit that the senior center is taking in 19. Any questions on the senior center budget? I'm sorry. I, I, so, so could you just tell us on, on the Meals on Wheels, where they come from and how they're paid for, and does that come out of your budget, Cindy, or no. what? No, it's um, <coughs> Meals on Wheels. Well, part of it does. I, I apologize. So Meals on Wheels is a contract through Dane County that we administer. The meals are under a contract that come out of Consolidated Foods out of Verona. Uh, we deliver approximately about 80 a day. The monies that come of donations for Meals on Wheels go directly back to the county. The county in turn then pays for some of the salary of the person that um, manages our kitchen the city pays some of her salary the county pays some of her salary and so the meals where where are the meals prepared and developed it's a contract um, that the county um, administers that it's consolidated foods out of verona okay and is it a net sum sort of thing that people pay for as many meals as they get or is it so on a donation basis and does it does it kind of equalize out no, the, the county still puts in some money okay. towards the program. And, but the city does not? Then. Not towards that. For the meals, no. For Kim's salary, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I'm, what is the kitchen fund? Is that for the... Uh, you, you all sponsor some meals? I'm trying to... We do. We sponsor some meals. Uh, we also, in every day, there's coffee and treats Popcorn. and things that are, that are um, available. So it's all of the food that we prepare. Um, it's an in and out. It's by donation. And then from those donations, we purchase the, um, the material that we need. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Cindy, merci. Au revoir. Okay. Next up, we have the clerk's budget. Um, again, we'll kind of just go line by line. Um, you can see health insurance is going up about four thousand dollars, or twelve percent. Again, this is due to two thirds of the clerk department employees having family insurance plans. Um, you can see salaries went from zero to, to uh, the $66,671. Again, that's just due to the restructure in the clerk department, um, promoting Holly to the department head, so now they have a salaries line. Wait, what, no? um, and then if you go down to the wages, you can see a drop by about 48776 Again, that's just due to salary or Holly moving up to salary and then a li uh, some increased wages, um, I think, on the deputy clerk side of it. I think she came in at a little bit higher rate than, than where Kelly was. Um, so overall, you can see a total shift of $20,640. Most of, the, most of that has to do with the increase in, in, in the salary amounts. Cool. Any specific questions on the clerk? Okay. Moving on. 
done. One more for Holly. This is the election one. Um, you can see we're dropping those costs down by about $14,000. Again, it just has to do with 2019 being an off election year. Um, so if you look at the cost for 2015 and 17, and then where we're budgeting for 19, it looks pretty reasonable in terms of overall election costs. So any questions on election? Yes. I have a question for Holly. Holly, have you um, looked at the cost of, uh, say, having um, voting at, like, the library? Because I know that they've started doing that in Madison. And I've had a couple of people actually come up to me and ask me if we're going to do that in the future. And so in anticipation of, like, say, the presidential election or something, you know, doing something, say, like on Saturday, since the library is open on Saturday, um, you know, I don't know if you've, you know, thought about that or, or explored any of that or the cost, but if not, I think that, you know, the community is going to start to expect some of that since I'm, I'm being stopped and I'm being asked about it. Right. Um, so that's something that we're working towards to make um, early voting or absentee voting more available. Um, starting this year, we're going to be open later that last week, and we extended it another week this time. Um, 2019, that's not something I've thought about at the library just because it's going to be just the spring election and possibly primary. Um, but for 2020, that's something that we could look into doing, um, especially at the library. I don't know if it's something that we would want to have there all day like Madison does, and then bringing the ballots back to our office. I, I don't know how much cost there is associated with that, but we could certainly look into doing like a couple Saturdays at the library. Oh. And actually, you know, testing it, say like on a spring election, you know, where you don't have quite the same turnout, you could actually maybe get some of the bugs out of it or something. Right. How late is the library open? Library is open till five o'clock on Saturday, but you don't okay. necessarily have to have the hours like all day Saturday. You could, you know, limit the hours, you know, because more than likely what would happen is you'd have to close it at a certain time because if people are waiting in line, you have to serve those people. So, you know, you'd have to probably close at three or four o'clock just to be on the safe side so that you don't keep the library open so you, you know so too you're long. mostly concerned about saturday voting hours well saturday or even sunday it you know people who you know work late you know this was one of the concerns you know the uh, a woman told me she said her 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 son just works late mm -hmm. and it's hard for him to even get in you know to do um even six o'clock because of his hours and where he works and so i was just you know throwing it out there that having you know some weekend hours hopefully could satisfy some people and since the library is already open Sorry. go ahead and then i just i'll have a follow-up when you're done the library closes at nine and i already started talking to richard the director of the library about this telling, letting them know about <laughs> So, I mean, I think what we can do is, you know, once we figure out what we're going to do with the bank, that may or may not change the direction this discussion goes. Regardless of what we have to do, we have to look at training and staffing as an additional cost and factor that into the budget and then try to figure out, you know, how that'll work because I mean, we're more than happy to tr try to provide the service, but if we're going to burn up, you know, hundreds of dollars for a handful of votes, we have to, we have to weigh that. But we, we won't know that until we try it. Well, and my concern is, is we can run a pilot, but we got to make sure there's an understanding that it is only a pilot because if we, we don't want people to get confused and think that it's permanent. If we don't know. So personally, if we move to the bank and the clerk's office moves into the bank, it might be more efficient just to extend the hours there than it would be to have it at the library. And those are the things we'd have to talk about. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, we could have later hours at City Hall and it would probably be easier for us because then we don't have to haul stuff back and forth. And I think it would be better security that way also. So I think there's a lot of things that we want to take into consideration. I don't think, you know, I don't know if we'll be able to do it next year or not. I guess we'll have to see where we land, but um, we may just get a ad hoc committee together or something and, and have that discussion. I have, uh, I, I've had a number of conversations with a few constituents as to why, where voting takes place, you know, why it's, why it's been for years and years to be voting at the First Lutheran and and uh, <laughs> different sites. So um, I know that some people are, you know, wondering how that, how it, it could be potentially changed to different sites and whether or not that would be more fair for both constituents and also for the sites that are hosting these things. I did talk to Mayor Swadley a while ago about about that and whether or not there is any possibility of of us looking at whether or not we have the the correct sites to to vote at and um and that could be a discussion related to this whole topic as well yeah and i think that's a fair one there's going to be you know the census in 2020 and then the redistricting after that so to minimize the confusion, I think we have to really have a long-term view of this and outline so we're not changing the voting location, then we redistrict it and change it again a year or two later. I remember when we voted in this room. Rodney, did you vote in this room? All four districts? Really? Tom, yes. <clears throat> Do you remember that? No, no. I remember. <laughs> All four districts voted in this room. You should have seen the lines. <laughs> so I think maybe as we move into next year, what we'll do is we'll come up with some <coughs> recommendations, and if the council wants to put together an ad hoc group to investigate this, we can do that. Mm -mm. So it could include the library, the library as being a, a potential place, city halls continued, and whether or not we're, we have the right places that people need to vote at during election day. So I, okay. okay. Any other questions on election? No. Oh, we should have Russia help pay your salary. <laughs> yeah, who? Russia. Yeah, really. Well, don't you know that they're going to to go in and 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 change um, the voter list? That's what I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that'd be a quick one. Legislative. <laughs> Okay, uh, legislative, uh, pretty straightforward, no changes here. Any questions on the legislative? This is you guys. Judicial, again, a couple little changes here just in terms of uh, the 3% increase in wages. Um, and of course, judicial. employee benefits would follow suit with that. Um, any questions on the judi judicial side of things? I want to do that instead. Um, whoever the judge is. And then finance director. Um, so we'll go through this. Obviously, we're seeing some big shifts here in terms of the restructure and everything that happened this year. So I'll just kind of go through a couple of the bigger line items. Um, you can see employer, you can see health insurance went up about twenty-two thousand five hundred sixty-nine. Again, that's just due to moving from a from the previous finance director who had a single plan over to Ryan and I who have um, have the family plans. And basically, this is getting split fifty-fifty between the utilities right now. Um, Next line down is the salaries. Again, you can see the $15,000 jump there. Again, just mainly due to the restructure and how we're allocating things. Um, we broke this down, 104 to the city and then about 96 to the utilities. Um, taxi grant, you can see it's going up by about $59,000. Again, this is offset by revenue. It's just we're kind of at the mercy of the grant application itself. It's not due till December 31st, so we're kind of, this is this is an estimate right now, but the majority of these costs are offset by the actual grant, grant revenue itself. So big shift on the expense side, but it's offset with the revenue. Um, and then the next jump again is the, the $5,117 in wages. Again, that's bringing on the assistant, the, the assistant finance director, and then the pay increases for Lisa and Debbie. I have to go and do more. So help any me. questions on the finance director budget? No, I like it. No. And this should stabilize then in 2020. Cool. I like it. OK, 
Okay, that's all we had scheduled for tonight. So November Aww. 1st, we have a couple more, just recreation, library, RDA. We'll talk a little bit about TIFs, go through the mayor's budgets, um, touch on CIP a little bit. I'll have a summary of all the kind of discussions we've had, any changes we've had. Um, and then that should really be about it for the November 1st discussion. Um, the agenda will probably get sent out to you folks on Tuesday, if that's okay. There won't really be any new information aside from what you've already received. Um, but I'm going to be out of town for a few days, so I'll get that out Tuesday after you guys. So. All right, Boy, if there's no babe, questions. We're done. Mortified this morning. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Good night. We voted you off. You're yeah, yeah, I know exactly. Like <laughs> was thinking oh, she wants to sit for a I did that. <laughs> exactly.